So uh, thanks for having me first and foremost and, and my, my dear appreciation uh, for everyone sitting here right now in the room. I hope it's worth, uh, worth attending and uh, it's a subject that is very dear to me uh, and it's, I think and I promise, it's also a very uh, fun topic. Um, it's the topic of the psychology of persuasion and the psychology of behavioral change. And what I really hope that you get out of uh, this presentation is that I, well, I think that um, the idea that I want to challenge is that uh, when we think about how to influence minds and shape behavior, we usually have a wrong idea of how influence works. We, tend, we, we used to think, or we tend to think, that if you want to change someone's mind and change their behavior, you have to convince and persuade them. And I want to, um, I want to, to show or to illustrate that this is a wrong approach. Um, if you want to influence mind and change behavior, you have to uh, approach it in a, in a different way. And the most important element is that you have to understand how our brain makes decisions. Because if you understand how humans uh, make up their mind, how humans make decisions, you can use that understanding uh, uh, you know, to, to create better communication, better products, um, uh, better services, etc. So, in order to, um, to do that and in order to definitely to keep your attention during this 40-minute uh, uh, masterclass, I want to present to you three riddles that I want to solve in my presentation. So the first one is this question. How come that a um, soda drink that when it launched in the market and they first let it test it in a taste panel uh, company, that the unanimous answer was that this was the most disgusting thing they ever tasted, people ever tasted, and yet it became the, uh, the most profitable uh, soft drink in the world. Second riddle, how come that this man, who's obviously a criminal, uh, became the president of, the most, uh, of the, the most powerful country in the world. And third riddle is, how come, and this is a, an interesting one, how come that, um, peop that these smartphones have become so addictive and so powerful that people actually start to treat reality as, as just a a decor for their, you know, for the virtual life. I live in, I'm a Belgian, I grew up around Bruges, I moved to Amsterdam 17 years ago, and it's hilarious to see how people visit Amsterdam these days. They used to visit Amsterdam to see Amsterdam. Now Amsterdam is just a decor in their, you know, in the, the theater they put up uh, uh, in their social life. This is actually a hilarious blog called Boyfriends of Instagrammers, uh, .tumblr .eu which basically is a, is a tribute to all these poor suckers who have to show up and film their girlfriends uh, while um, uh, acting on Instagram. So, three interesting riddles. And, um, spoiler alert, I think what they have in common is that they all use behavioral science, a deep understanding of how the brain works. They all use behavioral understanding to influence minds and shape behavior. And so, I think that the... the, the the key message uh, of, of my talk is, is that behavioral science and psychology is a far more interesting source for innovation than, than design or technology. I think when you look at all great uh, technology companies, the thing that really makes them successful is, of course, brilliant execution in design and technology. But the first and most important thing is, is that they have a deep understanding of psychology. And I want to illustrate that with a, couple of, um, with a couple of examples. And yes, this is absolutely a dark wisdom. Um, this is my favorite character, Dr. Evil. Um, uh, you probably, uh, wh whom of you have seen the, the Austin Powers movies? Okay, so you know that when he wanted to, you know, when, when, when the good guys wanted him to prevent, to destroy the world, he wanted one million dollar. Um, this is my, um, um, I think that behavioral science is, is this muhaha, dark wisdom. And, and righteously so, because you can actually do two things with it. You can manipulate people to the point where they are so hooked to the smartphone. You can manipulate their deepest fears and desires um, in such a way that they become totally addicted to the point that it even overrules a nice dinner with friends. But on the other hand, you can also use it for very positive behavioral change. And usually people who are most experienced in you know, understanding behavioral science and applying it are those who usually are very good at, at using it for bad purposes. But you can use it for very positive purposes as well. You can use it to get people to eat healthier, get people to work out, get people to, um, you know, to, 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 have sm to make smarter financial decisions, etc., etc., etc. So um, it's, it's not 
the science that is evil as such, it's the way we use it. And I think that, um, that we need to be very sensitive, uh, sensitive of that. In all the work I do, I always put the, 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 um, the end user at the, at the core of my, uh, my design or at the core of my strategies. And the question I'm always asking myself is, how does this end user get better from what I'm trying to achieve with them? Um, uh, and yes, I might do some things that manipulate their weakness. But for instance, when you think of um, having people to make smarter financial decisions, um, we usually make very, very stupid financial decisions all the time. So if you want people to do smarter things or make better financial decisions, we somehow have to manipulate them into, into doing those behaviors. Um, so yes, so before I... Before I delve into a couple of examples of um, uh, how uh, psychology could, could be used as a source, as a creative source for innovation, I first need to take one step back. And um, I, if you want to understand how human decision making works and how you can influence human decision making, you need to understand how our brain actually makes decisions. And um, this, this, the last 20 years of research and publications on uh, thinking about thinking really uh, all pays tribute to one, one book, one single book. Whom of you has read Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman and Tversky? A couple of people. Whom of you have tried to read it but thought, okay, that's a very honest answer, thank you. It's, um, it's, not, it's not your average, it's not your fun holiday book. It's the uh, combined work of two Israeli psychologists, Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky. Uh, they, no they won the Nobel Prize in economics for their work and I really they, they kind of completely rethought um, our whole understanding of how we make decisions. Um, and I'm going to try to, to you know, summarize the, 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 the book with which they won the Nobel Prize in economics to one kind of key slide and kind of key insight. So what Kahneman and Sversky discovered was that we have two uh, thinking systems in our brain, two, two ways of thinking, two, two, yeah, two decision-making systems in our brain. I call it system one, system two. So system one is our, uh, they call it our intuition, our instinct, um, whereas our system two is our rational brain. Our system one is, is incredibly fast, it's very, very automatic, whereas our rational brain, our system two, is rather very slow, and it only gets used when, when it's activated. It's only used on demand. I think the most, um, I think the best metaphor I discovered so far to kind of, um, you know, describe the workings of our, of our system one, our automatic brain, is that um, it's our system one, our, 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 our intuitive brain, our automatic brain, is like a predictive modeling machine. Uh, apparently, there are about 17,000 choices that are being presented to us on an average day. 17,000. Now, imagine that you, you would have to, um, um, you know, to process these, all these choices in a deliberate way. You would get completely crazy. To, to, to bring that idea to life, imagine that you're driving with your car on a highway or in a, in a, a typical you know, two-lane way. And imagine that you have to process all the time whether the, uh, the, 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 the people driving in the other direction would, would crash you or kill you or not. Or with every people who cross you in the street, is this person going to kill me or rape me? That would be a very, very exhausting thing. And of course, you don't do that. You don't think about that because your automatic brain perfectly understands that people will stick to their lane and that most people walking around in Mechelen are not psychopaths. Um, so you, you don't need to think about it anymore. Your automatic brain makes the decisions for you. Well, this is actually about every decision that we made, we, f we make, we first want to make them with our automatic brain. It, even better, it's not that we want to make them, we simply make them. And then, and this is the interesting part, we then use our rational brain to post-rationalize our intuitive decision. So this is kind of a, a, a hard one to process. Well, it, it, it kind of, it sounds logic at first sight, but it's a hard one to process. And there's two reasons for that. First one is, is that we think of ourselves that we are rational people. We're not. We are very, very intuitive. We make up our mind intuitively, and then we use our rational brain to post-rationalize or to, to provide ourselves with bullshit arguments why our intuitive decision is the right one. I'm going to give you some examples of that in a bit. Second thing is, is that once we put on our professional hat, uh, we kind of tend to work with system two. 
we kind of try to persuade and convince people with rational arguments why they should do the things we want them to do. We are very much into, uh, and even if we try to work with system one, even if we would try to seduce people, if you work in an organization in which lawyers look at your text, they will knock out all the seduction out of your text and then uh, will, have, will, will kind of force you to, you know, to use rational arguments. But the theory of Kahneman and Tversky actually said you can't persuade and convince someone who hasn't already decided that they want to be persuaded and convinced. So when you want to influence minds and shape behavior, you have to work with system one. And how we're going to do it, I want to illustrate that in, in a couple of seconds. So the most pragmatic, um, um, before I delve into that, a, a quick example of this, this working in, uh, uh, of, of system one and system two. Imagine you're doing a job interview. Um, um, turns out there's a lot of scientific evidence that you make up your mind about a candidate within one to five minutes. And in the rest of the interview, you will look for confirmation that confirms your initial hunch. You make up your mind based on shortcuts. Do I like this person? Do I see this person working in my team? Uh, does, does he or she have a, a good sounding voice? Has she, he or she been working for uh, a, another company for a long time? That kind of means that she must be good enough, etc., etc. Well, imagine that this person would say that uh, she took a year off to travel abroad. If you like that person, if you would like that person within a minute, you, your, uh, your system too would immediately provide you with uh, things like, it's awesome, this person really is an adventurous person, we need more adventurous person, uh, people, we need more adventurous people in this company, she will be a great match. If you had decided intuitively within a couple of minutes that you hate that person, your system too will tell you, oh, she's been traveling abroad for one year, oh, it's definitely one of those soul-seeking persons uh, who's not sure about their life, we can't have those, those people in our company. So, I think the most pragmatic way to think about uh, influence is that when you are trying to influence minds, what we're really doing is we're offering system one shortcuts to make a decision without having to think. And this brings me, to illustrate this point, this brings me with my first riddle, Red Bull. So, true story, when they launched, I think, 25, 30 years ago, uh, they, uh, every company that launches a new product in the market, they first go to this Swiss company uh, orga that organizes tasting panels. And, and as I said in the beginning, when this, this company came back to them, we have never seen anything like this before, but, but across all categories, people consistently said, this is absolutely disgusting. It's like, it tastes like medicine. It's, it's a coffin syrup, but then with fizz. That, that was kind of the, uh, the, the thing. So they said, don't do it, don't launch it, work on the flavor, and then return. And Red Bull basically said, well, thanks, but no thanks, but we're going to do it anyway. What Red Bull did instead was pure psychological alchemy. Um, uh, what they did is they reprogrammed the way we looked at the problem and uh, at the product, and not only not only reprogrammed the way we looked at the problem, but they actually reprogrammed the way we experienced the problem, the product, not the problem, problem, the product. Whew, it's tongue twister. Um, it's because there's this timer here in front of me, so it kind of triggers me to to talk fast. So. Um, um, uh, shit, I now lost my train of thought. Um, uh, what they came up with was a brilliant shortcut, a system one shortcuts to make us completely rethink and re-experience the way they look, we look at the problem. The most important one was that they invented the word energy drink. And so they basically said, from now on, we divide the world in two kind of soft drinks. There's the soft drink. They taste sweet, like Coca-Cola. They are in, in these round cans. Um, these are, when you're thirsty, you need to drink a soft drink. But we are an energy drink, something completely different. Uh, when you drink our drink, it's you drink it because you want to have energy. Now, once you use that word energy, people go, it actually, it, it tastes a little bit like medicine, so it must be true. It must have these potent powers that would give me energy. Otherwise, it wouldn't taste like medicine. Second shortcut they give is they, they well, I think the brilliant uh, intervention was they, they kind of um, designed a new format of cans. All soft drink cans have the same size. They invented a new size so that you would automatically, your automatic brain would think of it as something different from the soft drinks. They also made the cans smaller. So your automatic brain would immediately go, yeah, th this must be so powerful that they had to put it in smaller cans, otherwise your heart would explode. 
Um, and they actually made it more expensive. Uh, it's about uh, one third more expensive than Coca-Cola, which again is a system one signal that this must be powerful stuff because it's more expensive. Actually, this is quite often how price psychology works. We have no idea what something costs, but we derive the value from the fact that it's expensive. Must be good, otherwise it, w it, it wouldn't be that expensive. The other way around is also equally too. If you price something uh, uh, too cheap, people might derive the perception that it's actually it's it's worthless because it's it it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be valuable if people uh, uh, if it only cost that much money. You have to be very very sensitive to that. This is also a great example of system of thinking about the automatic brain. This is Eneco in, in Rotterdam, uh, their headquarters. Now most companies uh, in the Netherlands, and I guess the same is true in Belgium, when you enter a, a corporate building, you kind of are funneled into this group for security uh, people. And everything signals we treat you as a, as a criminal unless you can uh, uh, you know, show to us that you're not a criminal. Then we will let you through our castrating gates uh, uh, once you are, you are cleared. Um, so a very kind of negative threatening uh, design, uh, design of, of perception. They completely uh, changed that. There's three pods, uh, a couple of uh, uh, hostesses, whenever you enter the building, you get approached by one of them with a laptop, they welcome you, say, uh, uh, you have an appointment, yes, uh, where's your name? Okay, let me please um, uh, take you to the espresso bar, uh, we'll give you a good espresso, take your seat, I will call uh, the person who you're visiting. It completely transforms the way you experience uh, the, 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 whole, you know, the whole welcoming part of that company, and it changes your perception of that company. So, um, we need to be very, very. Uh, we need to become very aware of the fact that uh, everything we do and say um, gets in interpreted in a, in, a, in a particular way, and we are sometimes uh, uh, we are quite often blind to the effect of the words that we use. You need to think of our, your, your brain or our brain as a neural network. And whenever you use a, uh, a particular word, you activate um, uh, other you know, uh, associated words in your brain and you suppress words that, that don't have to do anything with that word. Um, so imagine that, that I'm your doctor and I just made a diagnose, and it's very clear what your condition is, so I, um, I, I have to bring you the message. And in the first scenario, I can tell you, look, you have this particular condition, but don't worry, there's a treatment, it's good news, there's a treatment, and this treatment has about 90% chance of saving your life. You would immediately go, let's have it, where can I sign? I can tell exactly the same, from a rational point of view, the same message, but use different words. I just uh, um, uh, diagnosed you, you have this condition, I have very bad news for you, uh, you have this particular decision, there is a treatment though, but you have to be aware of the fact there's a 10% chance that you will die. Now, if I use these words, I activate all kinds of thoughts of, you know, losing your family, dying, etc. You will be terrified. But from an objective point of view, I said exactly the same thing. So we need to be very, very, very sensitive that every word we use um, uh, you know, triggers uh, uh, all kinds of thoughts and beliefs and emotions that are associated with them. With them. So, um, m my profession as a uh, behavioral designer is I, I, I tend to think of my, uh, the work that I do, I, I think that the most pragmatic definition to think about influence is to think about choice design. Because when you think about the workings of system one, your automatic brain, what your automatic brain is responding to is the way a choice is being presented to you, all the time. Uh, the way you design a choice, whether it's in words, whether it's in interactions, whether it's in images, whether it's in processes, etc., your automatic brain responds to the way a choice is being presented to you. And so, if we can work with thinking about how we can design choices, we really have a very good way to, to think about positively change people's uh, behavior. So, I want to illustrate that with a couple of, you know, not only examples, but a couple of principles. I, th I think of behavioral science and behavioral psychology as a, as a tool set, a toolbox of interesting psychological principles to play with. 
to, you know, to, to use, to think about designing communication and designing uh, products and services and interactions. And I want to, if we have the time, I'll, I, I want to explore four principles. Maybe we'll, we'll have to um, wrap it up with three. Um, so this first principle uh, is, is, is about choice architecture. Um, and this, uh, this connects with what I just said about pricing, is that we sometimes, well, we, we often have no idea what something should cost, so we kind of try to derive um, uh, uh, our perception of value based, for instance, on the price. So this first principle basically says that um, since we are completely price clueless, we are quickly looking for signals in the context to make up our mind about what something should cost. So this is, a, a, for instance, a, a, a marvelous example, Louis Vuitton. Um, they, for what I've read, is that about 90% of their sales is uh, the small things, like sunglasses and wallets. Uh, they cost about 300 euros. So uh, a 300 euro sunglass of Louis Vuitton and a 300 dollar uh, euros uh, wallet is, is like the, the cheap entry into the Louis Vuitton world. But what Louis Vuitton stores brilliantly, of cheap, cheekishly do, is that they first anchor your perception to the 10,000 euros handbag. And so once you've uh, perceived the 10,000 euros handbag, in the context of that 10,000 euro handbag, the 300 euro sunglasses feel like a bargain. There's, by the way, there's the saying that if you want to sell Ferraris, you have to go to a billionaire uh, super yacht fair, because in comparison with the super yacht, the Ferrari feels like bargain chips. Um, and, and so the context determines the way we think of, uh, of um, or the way we perceive the value. Apparently, and this is, uh, actually I checked this with, with IKEA and they told me the story is true. The reason, one of the main reasons why the restaurant of IKEA is in the beginning of the store or they let you first walk past this uh, restaurant is that you have a fairly good idea of what eating out in a restaurant should cost. And you immediately understand that eating at IKEA costs about one third of eating in a normal restaurant. But you have no idea what furniture costs. We usually no one, no, no one of us do, uh, do. So with this, this, this same you know, um, um, perception of value, you then enter the, uh, the furniture part of the store. It's deliberately designed to anchor your price perception at IKEA is about one third in the cost of, of, uh, of normal, uh, normal stores. I'll skip that, that example. This is, uh, <laughs> by the way, this is a true story. I, um, I did a workshop with uh, engineers of General Electric a couple of months ago, and I, I hadn't looked at this picture uh, that well, and I was absolutely, my system one was absolutely convinced that this was an invention by Philips. So I told, I told these, these people the story and I said, look, this is an amazing example of Philips of how the design of the context completely transformed the way kids experience a CT scanner. And so one, one of the guys in the workshop said, I designed this device. It says General Electric on top of it, and it was quite embarrassing. Um, and, but the brilliant, uh, this is a CT scanner for children. And what they, what they uh, first learned was that a lot of children are completely terrified of going into a CT scanner. And then they start screaming, and, and y you just don't get any good result out of it. What General Electric came up with was that they completely redesigned the context in which the CT scan is being presented to children. They have uh, shaped it as part of an adventure. So the adventure starts in the dressing room, kids get kind of draw, uh, brought into a storyline, and in order to solve the mystery, they have to get into the machine to, to figure out how the end of the story uh, is being solved. Absolutely brilliant, because these kids don't even, are not even aware that they have to go into this terrifying device. They just want to you know, experience the end of the story. It doesn't basically cost anything in the machine. It's just a completely redesign of the context in which the desired behavior is being presented. It's absolutely genius. Um, this is a, I'll, you have to watch it up on YouTube, it's hilarious. Uh, normally, people would pay 100 dollars or 100 euros easily, you know, to go to an Ed Sheeran concert. It sells out within five minutes. Um, two Australian comedians uh, did something completely different. They uh, uh, set up a peep show somewhere in a shopping street in Melbourne and uh, put Ed Sheeran in that peep show and then tried to get people to, you know, to, to buy a ticket of $2 to see Ed Sheeran. 
Well, it took them about four hours to find a brave soul to enter the shop, to only to their uh, uh, excitement that indeed Ed Sheeran was sitting there behind the curtain. Quite, quite hilarious. And I, th I think this is a, um, a brilliant example of exactly the opposite, is the way you present you know, the choice, uh, go and see Ed Sheeran, but in such a way that it completely destroys the whole value perception. Because if this guy is kind of lurking you in and going, you want some Ed Sheeran, you're going, this, this doesn't feel good at all. And it costs $2, so it must be fake. Um, um, so uh, well, I, I think what is quite genius is that if you, if you would use the opposite of it and start to design the choice in such a way that it completely destroys the value, people wouldn't even you know, be paid to, to go and see Ed Sheeran. So second, um, a second innovation. First one is, is that when you design choices, think about the context in which you present the choice. Second one is, um, think outside in. We have the tendency to think inside out, which means that uh, it, it, this idea of thinking inside out is kind of embodied in this, co is the, in this concept of we need to put the customer at the center of what we do. I kind of don't like that phrase. And the reason is very simple. If I say, we need to put the customer at the center of what we do. What you're basically thinking of is the problem of the customer is that he hasn't figured out yet how awesome our offering is. And so our, the, our solution is we need to get better at making him or her, or her understand uh, um, uh, our offer. We need to put a, a more nice, you know, um, um, we need to package it more nicely. What I think we need to be doing is not put the customer at the center of what we do, but put the humans at the center of what we do. You know, the human behind the customer. And there's a great uh, concept, um, you know, uh, coined by uh, Clayton Christensen, the godfather of innovation. Uh, he sadly died a couple of years ago. Uh, one of the biggest thinkers in, in, in innovation and marketing. And he came up with this job to be done concept. He said basically the essence of marketing, to understand the essence of marketing is that People have jobs to be done in their life for which they hire products and services. And he tells this, this uh, beautiful story of uh, a fast food restaurant that wanted to you know, increase the sales of their milkshake. And first they tried it inside out. You know, they asked customers what, uh, if they liked their milkshake and they made them you know, taste new forms of milkshakes and then they improved the milkshake and it, it had zero impact on sales. So in the, second, um, in the second attempt to figure out how to boost the milkshake, they went outside in. And the question they asked themselves is, what is, the, what is the deeper need or drive or job to be done that people have in their life for which they come to hire a milkshake? Well, it turns out uh, that um, half of the people who, saw, who bought a milkshake bought them before 8 o'clock in the morning. Disclaimer, it's America. Um, they all just bought a milkshake and then drove off with it. Well, it turned out that the, the reason why they bought a milkshake was that they had a long and boring drive to work and they needed something to fill, you know, to fill their stomach. But since they were driving, a milkshake really was the best option because every other thing just, just crumble over you or, or you, 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 you know, um, it, th there's, there's so many products that, that don't fit that job very well. And the milkshake really is the best one because you can drive and drink and it takes a long time and it fills your stomach. So if you would then think about how do I promote a milkshake, well, you would promote the job to be done. Like you would put on billboards next to the, next to the highway that says, look, if you need something, uh, uh, something to fill your stomach for a long and boring drive, there's a, a McDonald's here at the next exit. Have a, have, a, have a great milkshake. Or if you would like to reduce anxiety, you would go, uh, did you already have a protein breakfast this morning? Get your protein breakfast at, uh, at McDonald's. You basically say exactly the same. It's a milkshake, but by reframing it, again, system one thinking, if you reframe it as a protein breakfast, people would feel less, less guilty about it. Now, this brings me to penises. <laughs> you always need to, uh, 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 well, yeah, you always need to have a penis in your presentation. <laughs> and, and kittens, you all also need kittens in your presentation. Uh, but preferably penises. So the reason why I introduced uh, uh, this slide is I thought it was hilarious. Uh, there was um, a uh, town in England called Teesside, and uh, people in that community were complaining to the city council for more than a year uh, that, uh, that they should fix the potholes in the road. But the uh, city council just, just didn't act, didn't do anything. And then a local resident came up with a brilliant idea. He spray-painted spray -painted penises around every pothole. 
Now, within a week, the problem was fixed. The problem was solved. Why? Because the job to be done for the city council of removing obscenity from the community, you know, public sphere was much more important than, you know, maintenance work. Suddenly, the job to be done changed and they, and they, uh, they had to act. Um, uh, we, this is a project we did for uh, Medtronic, a company for people, you know, that, that, that creates technology for people with diabetes. And um, this was the first product they uh, brought to the market directly to consumers. It's uh, basically a, a chip uh, that you tie to your, you know, to your skin, and then it's connected to your smartphone, and whenever your glucose level drop under a, a certain threshold, your smartphone would start buzzing. And so, um, uh, Medtronic said to us, uh, before you, 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 you test it with people, um, I, we have to say that, that there's still a bit of a bug in it. Uh, this, 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 the sound in the, in the app, the sound that the app produces, is really annoying. It's this buzzing sound. We need to fix that. So, we first uh, uh, interviewed people with diabetes and, and, uh, and then also showed them the, uh, the equipment. And the first thing we learned was that the, the job to be done you know, the deepest need of people with diabetes is that they want to live a normal life and being unbothered as, as, as little as possible by their disease. That's their, that's their deepest wish, their deepest need. And everything they look for, like new technology, new, new solutions, is being, um, is being driven by this desire to live a normal life without being bothered by their disease. And so we told them about this, this, uh, this technology and about the bug. And, and actually, one, one of our respondents said, are you kidding me? This is awesome. That this is not a bug, this is a feature. Because now I, can, I don't need to think about my diabetes anymore because my buzzer will tell me when I have to. This, uh, this allows me to live a, a, a life, a normal life, without having to think constantly about my glucose levels. So it, it completely transformed the way, the way the company thought about, uh, about how to position, for instance, the product to, the, to their end user. Still have a little 10 minutes left, so I'll, 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 I'll skip a couple of examples. Um, this is a project we, we did for the Dutch government. Um, they asked us to find a strategy to, um, you know, to convince the last 15% of Dutch people to get, to get vaccinated in, um, in the uh, in the during the first wave of COVID. And uh, it, was, uh, it was absolutely fun to, you know, to, to be able to do in-depth interviews with uh, people who are, uh, are very much against vaccination. Because you, you want to learn what, what, are their, what are their stories. Well, about, about 90% of them, uh, it's not that they were not convinced that the, that the vaccination could work. It was that they hated the government. And they didn't want to have anything that the government had to say anything about their life. So as long as you try to convince them that the vaccination is good for them, you try to persuade them on a system two level, they would just throw up their finger and go, yeah, whatever, I, I don't want to listen to you. Uh, and I'm, I'm, it, it might be, but I'm not going to be forced by the government to take a vaccination. And so what we discovered was the only way for people to, you know, to be able to consider uh, getting vaccinated was to not talk them about the vaccination, but uh, connect with job to be done. And so the, the question uh, that, that really resonated with a lot of people was, how much is it worth to you that, um, that for not getting vaccinated, you can't go out anymore, you can't go to a restaurant, you can't go to a theater? Is it really that, that much worth to you? Or not, and it's actually a beautiful clip, and, and I, I wish I could I could find it, but I, I I have I've I've searched it this morning, but I couldn't find it anymore. There was this girl; she was interviewed by I think Dumpert, the site in the Netherlands, and um, um, the, the, uh, I think she was 13, 14 years old. And so the interviewer asked her about a, va a vaccination, and she was very very activist. No, it's a uh, it's a bad idea, and people shouldn't be forced to have a vaccination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the interviewer said, "So you're not vaccinated?" And she said. Yes, of course I am vaccinated. So the interview said, oh, can you explain that? He said, well, otherwise I, w I couldn't get into McDonald's. And, and that, was, that was so brilliant. The job to be done for her was to be able to get into McDonald's uh, with her friends. And quite often, and you, you, you kind of intuitively understand that from your personal relationship, the more you, s you try to persuade people that their belief is wrong, the more they get into resistance. Because by attacking your belief, you're attacking the person. You're attacking your uh, person's identity 
identity because our identity is kind of really, you know, our beliefs are, are a core part of our identity. So never attack, never try to persuade and convince people that they're wrong because even if they kind of perfectly understand that they're wrong, they will reject every attempt of you to, you know, to, to um, uh, every, every power attack f of you, you know, to, to make them change their mind. So I, with five minutes left, um, this is one of my favorite principles, and this sounds a bit geeky, but I think that um, framing and question substitution is a very, very powerful way to think about, you know, rethinking about how you present reality. So this brings me to my second uh, riddle, um, uh, Mr. Trump. I think what Trump and uh, kind of the Trump playbook is being used by all populists all over the world is that Trump's ask a far more exciting question to, its vo to his voters. That's simply, this is how Vlaams Belang works in Belgium, this is how PVV works in the Netherlands, this is how Trumpism works. The question they ask is much more exciting than the question that, you know, the, the normal centrist elite parties ask. The question Trump's, uh, Trump has fabricated that, that generated so much excitement with his voter base is basically, well, the slogan is let's make America great again. But what he connected with was um, this idea of you know, feeling rejected, feeling left behind. He wanted, he, what he is selling to people is, I will make you pride again. We'll, we'll kick the ass of the liberal elites in the coastal cities. We will br bring back jobs and bring back pride to, you know, to the deplorables. He was very grateful that Hillary used the word deplorables because that was exactly the sentiment that he kind of was, was, was able to tap into. And it's, of course, his way of dealing with it, you can comment on it, but the feeling of not being recognized and being um, uh, rejected is, is deep and is real. Uh, and he was much better at connecting with that. So I've been working a lot uh, for uh, 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 Rutte in the last couple of years as well, basically to figure out how to, you know, how to craft a question to which Mark Rutte is the best answer in the Netherlands. Because in the Netherlands, uh, Rutte also has, has to deal for the last seven years to, you know, has to deal with populists who try to, who try to you know, get rid of him. And what we discovered in the work we've been doing is that if the election is about one question and one question only, Mark Rutte wins the election. And so the question in the Netherlands has always been about leadership. If the question is who needs to be the CEO of the Netherlands or what kind of leader does this country need, people uh, uh, automatically, even people who normally vote other, other uh, parties, will, will tell Mark Rutte. He has the most you know, kind of leadership aura. And if you would then uh, present the choice in such a way, look, we, we are, this is an important election. We can give away the keys of the country to Geert Wilders. Or, um, uh, you know, will Geert Wilders become the leader of the country? Or uh, do you don't want Geert Wilders to become the leader of the country? Well, vote for Mark Rutte, because he's the only one who can, uh, who can fight Geert Wilders. And every time that the uh, discussion in the weeks prior to the election was about leadership, we knew that, that we would win the election. Because to that question, Mark Rutte is the only answer. This is not the question you should be answering in the voting booth. You, you ra much rather should be answering a question about, you know, how much does this party and their program match with my values, etc. But that's a far more, that's a far too difficult system to question. The easy question is much more, uh, is much more fun and engaging to answer. So um, just like with Beyond Burgers, if I would say, uh, do you want to eat a vegetarian burger? It kind of feels like a a rip-off version of a real hamburger. Well, Beyond Meat did something purely psychological magic, they did something great. They don't say this is a vegetarian version of a burger, hamburger. They said this is a Beyond Burger. It's Beyond Meat. This is the juiciest hamburger you will ever have. Oh, and by the way, it's plant-based. This is also great, for, uh, well, this is bad framing. I really think that the government should stop calling taxes taxes because a tax is something very negative. It's something that is being afflicted, uh, inflicted upon you. I think we should start talking about contribution because taxes are all about contribution fee to use all the, you know, the stuff that we can use, education, roads, uh, uh, um, uh, healthcare, etc. And, and paying your contribution fee to make use of all these beautiful things from society is actually a much, much more positive frame. Just like uh, in, in tech, you can visit the help desk or you can visit the genius bar. A, um, uh, if you go to a help desk, that means you need help. 
This is again a beautiful example of how words activate ideas and thoughts and emotions. A help desk is kind of not, not nice because you, you are too stupid to work with your, with your computer, you need help. The genius bar is a completely more positive frame. These things are so difficult, take them to the geniuses, they will solve it. They actually design it like a bar, so you, you go to the bar, very, very friendly and positive frame. So with the 10 second left, I'll, I'll, I'll have to skip the fourth, uh, the fourth one. So, um, oh, let, let me quickly go to my last riddle, because otherwise I will leave you with, um, yes, um, um, this one. Um, so I, th I think, th maybe this is more a conclusion, this, uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, you know, how incredibly strong and, and, and addictive these devices have become, because they are perfectly, they perfectly understand how to tap into our deepest fears and emotions. And, and I once read this beautiful sentence that said, currently, with the combination of psychology, design and technology, we're witnessing a race to the bottom of the brainstem which is a race to really the, the deepest part of our unconscious brain. And I think the point that I tried to make was that these companies or politicians, etc., are really, really good at, you know, at, at, um, at going to the deepest part of the brainstem. But I think with also the positive examples that I shared, I really hope to, to have inspired you uh, to trigger excitement and curiosity that in the behavioral science, there's a lot to be found you know, to, to, to excite people for products and services or to build better products or to improve marketing. Because once you understand how the brain works and how the brain makes decisions, then it's much more easy to, you know, to, to, to connect to that. And one more thing, we just published the book, The Art of Designing Behavior or The Kunst van Gedrag Ontwerpen. It's also published in Dutch, so if you want to learn more, Read the book, subscribe to the news brief. Thank you very much.